Well, I'm going to do a little bit of an intro and we'll keep, I'll keep letting people in as they come along and um, everyone feel free uh, to have your videos on for the intro and hellos with Benedette and then you can always take them off or leave them any which way you'd like. Um, most of the time you will be muted, uh, but Benedette will be asking for questions periodically in the chat, as well as having a question and answer at the tail end. Um, and everyone also received printouts if they had wanted to print and make the project. So keep that in mind. Um, when we get started with the act, when I turn the program over to Benedette, uh, you might want to choose speaker view, you know, while the presenter's talking, it'll help focus more on Benedette than on the rest of us. Um, if you need to step away or, you know, have an interruption, again, feel free to turn off your video. Uh, and we've noticed that if people are calling in from their handset, from their phones, uh, that your phone number shows up. So FYI, uh, if you mute your handset, it makes that go away. Um, and we want uh, to ask for feedback. We'll be sending a survey after the fact. Uh, and we will also, during the program, uh, be sending a poll asking you how many people are watching with you who might be off camera, just so that we keep uh, track of attendees uh, for our grant reports, which leads me to the next thing. A thank you to the Central Berkshire Fund of the Berkshire Taconic Community Foundation and Fairfield County's Community Foundation for the funding we get to run all of our programming. It allows us to have Zoom, it allows us to bring in many different presenters. Uh, so it's a big thank you to them. There is a recording of this event happening um, and we will post it on our YouTube channel. So if you have anyone who couldn't attend this evening with you, um, or we had people interested who can't attend you know, this evening, uh, it's available to watch after the fact, or if there was some tidbit of information you wanna go back and listen to again. Again, it's, uh, it will be in the post uh, event survey for you. Uh, I'm just trying anything else. And um, we look forward to your um, input for our brainstorming on what other programs you would like to have us uh, present for you, both uh, virtually and in person, okay? And so for now, I'm gonna turn everything over to Benedette. Benedette, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, when I found out there was a NASA ambassador program with presentations available, um, I got beautifully nerdily excited. So, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Thank you for writing writing a, fo a fellow nerd, and uh, I got so excited too. <laughs> it's been great. It's been great to get to know you in this process too. Yeah. Um, well, let's start with two minutes on the planet Mars, shall we? Thank you. Let's run this back a little bit more just so we can see how quiet it is. It can, I guess it can be windy and, and a little loud, but. Well, that was a little bit about what this is all about. Um, my name is Benedette Manning. I'm an educator, mathematician, computer scientist, and NASA Solar System Ambassador. And if you'd like, please put your name in the chat or uh, just announce it. I'd like to know who's here. 
and let this be as interactive as uh, it can. I'm watching the chat right now, or you can just announce it. Hello, Matthew, Concord, New Hampshire. Hello, Wendy. Wendy Pearson. <laughs> Hello, Sonia and Hal. John and Phil, Susan Morris, hi. Hello, Jody. Uh, I think we can all read each other questions, so I don't feel like I need to read them out loud, but I think these are really great questions uh, about the wheels. Uh, I, I never even thought about that. And how, how does it say clean? And how long, how long it took the rovers to get to Mars? I actually think um, I might know that answer. I'm not sure. Uh, when did the vehicles land on Mars? We will talk about that. Uh, and is each rover similar to all wheel drive? That's a really good question. And the first one was all, all the wheels on the same plane. I guess my question is, are they, what are they wheels on the rover? I really didn't notice that. So thank you for these are really, really great questions. Didn't that feel pretty good to ask those questions in the beginning? I love that. Well, you guys can continue to put your name in the chat. It's so nice to meet you. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, we have four goals tonight. And that is to do some information on what's going on with that rover perseverance you always hear on the on the um, news and its pers and its purpose. Why is it on Mars? And understand why did NASA choose the location of the rover, which is is a Jacero crater. This that sort of goes together. And then the second part of the presentation is to discuss. What is diversity? What is the past and the current diversity in the space program? And then right at the end, we're gonna introduce really exciting mission that's being developed by Mars right now. They have lots of missions, by the way, but this one's uh, called the Artemis. And um, it has an explicit goal of diversity. So that's pretty exciting. Okay, so um, look a little close at the Perseverance rover. Uh, that's on the left-hand side, and it lands at Jacero Crater on Mars. The rover's on the left-hand side. The Curiosity, which is the big brother, big sister, or uh, the first be, uh, before the Perseverance, is on the right-hand side. I know there have been several, several missions to Mars. I don't know about them all. Um, I was going to talk about Curiosity, and then I decided, well, Perseverance and curiosity are uh, nearly the same. They're about the same. Um, over the last two decades, uh, missions from flown from, by NASA's Mars Exploration Program have shown us that Mars was once very different from the cold, dry planet it is today. Evidence discovered by landed and orbital missions point to wet conditions billions of years ago. These environments lasted long enough to potentially support the development of microbial life. One thing about perseverance, it carries seven instruments to conduct unprecedented science and test new technology on the red planet. Now I'm not gonna go over them all and I don't understand them all either, um, but one of them I'm going to talk about is called the MEDA. And let's see if I see it here. I don't see it. It's called the Mars Environmental Dynamics Analyzer, a set of sensors that provide measurements of temperature, wind speed and direction, pressure, relative humidity, and dust size and shape. That sounds a lot like what meteorologists do here on Earth. The rover is uh, car size, and uh, it's roughly the same dimensions as the Curiosity. It's about 10 feet long, 
nine feet wide and seven feet tall. Well, that's a big car actually. And it's about um, 2,260 pounds. And the Perseverance is about 300 pounds heavier than the Curiosity. Okay, so we're gonna meet the rover Perseverance in its landing spot on Mars. And here's some quick facts about the Perseverance. So one thing I think is really interesting is the rover is gonna seek signs of ancient life. And when I first heard that, I thought, well, what, what, why is that a big deal? And now I guess I know. They're gonna collect rock and soil samples and um, they wanna know really what happened on Mars. If Mars was a lot like the earth or something else, what happened? Uh, it was launched in July 30th, 2020 at Cape Canaveral, that's what a famous place. And it landed February 18th, 2021. So how long was that? How long was that, that journey? Somebody might wanna put that in the chat. How many days was that? Um, they're at Jacero Crater and we're gonna talk about what's on that crater and why, the, why are we so interested in the crater. And the mission is gonna last about one Mars year or 687 Earth days. And I was just wondering how many Earth days, um, if 687 Earth days, how many years is that? Can ask my own questions, right? And we've heard a lot about the ingenuity. Um, I guess every mission has a tech demo, I'm not sure. That's the Mars helicopter. So I'm gonna really click to that for a minute. This presentation is really not about ingenuity, but it doesn't hurt. A lot of people are really interested in, in the ingenuity, as I am too. Since the atmosphere in Mars is so dense, sorry, so thin, a lot of people are wondering, how does that work? How does a helicopter um, fly in such a dense place. Okay, I see some more questions. I don't know that the colors in your video, what we would see if we were there. I don't know, that is really a good question. Show subtitles, okay, more show subtitles, I'm not sure. That is an awesome question. I'd like to have one of those helicopters. Instead of a quadcopter. Good question. I got 212 days for the trip from launch to landing. All right, 212 days, all right. Anybody else? And how many years, a Mars years is how many, how many Earth? 687 Mars, um, Earth days, how many? years is that let's get that right so there's a lot going on here i didn't expect so much to be going on in this video but just a little just a little bit about the uh perseverance rover and the helicopter let's go to jacero crater that's where that's where they they sent it i'm gonna do a little here's a picture of the crater actually there's another picture in color of this crater i believe these are all of the uh the trips to Mars. I had no idea there were so many. That's crazy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine trips to Mars. Um, here's just Cerro Crater, 28 miles wide and lo located on the western edge of a flat plain. I don't know how to pronounce that, uh, but let's take a tour of it. I kind of like this video, so. This flyover was produced from NASA images taken from orbit. The blue circle indicates the area the rover will likely land, with the arcing hills in the center, about 1,600 feet high and are the rim of Jezero Crater. The goal of Mars 2020 is to learn whether life ever existed on Mars. 
It's too cold and dry for life to exist on the Martian surface today. But after Jezero Crater formed billions of years ago, water filled it to form a deep lake about the same size as Lake Tahoe. Eventually, as Mars climate changed, Lake Jezero dried up and surface water disappeared from the planet. An ancient lake is a fantastic place to pursue our goal of looking for possible Martian life. On Earth, lakes are filled with living creatures. Evidence of that life is often preserved in the mud and sand deposited on the bottom of the lake. So we use the rover's instruments to explore the rocks of the ancient lake bed. Here we can see evidence of the former lake. The canyon cutting through the crater rim was carved by a river. As the water entered the lake, it slowed and dropped the sand and mud it was carrying to form the fan-shaped delta. The white line is a path the rover might follow in its first two years, called the prime mission. During this period, we use the rover science instruments to analyze the lake sediments. After we explore the delta, we hope to investigate the shoreline of the former lake. To get there, we have to traverse around a sea of modern sand dunes. From this perspective, you can see former shorelines curving around a headland. We can picture waves in Lake Jezero beating on a sandy beach. And finally, we will press on to the crater rim. Jezero Crater formed when a large object collided with Mars, excavating rocks from deep in the Martian crust, exposing them in the rim for us to study. These rocks would have been hot shortly after the impact and may have hosted hot springs. Deposits from these springs would be another target in our search for possible ancient life on Mars. All right, thank you for that, uh, uh, Jody. So I hope you all uh, like that. I certainly did. Uh, I saw NASA actually has lots of activities for young minds, but frankly, I love them myself. One of them is the star shade, and I don't know if you can see it, but I made one. It's, um, and we can discover what that is and why people use it. So let's look at the star shade. And this actually is a star shade that I saw I, where was I? I think I was in um, Seattle before the uh, pandemic, probably in 2019. And uh, I saw that and I really liked it. So, uh, and then I, I didn't realize, I didn't really know what it was, but now, now, now I know, and let's hope that you all get to see too. There it is, star shade, all right. So, uh, there should be some at the Antonym, and there's also uh, the links. We'll show you how to make them too. There's your star shade, so let's check it out. It's called Chronograph. Astronomers now know that virtually every star in the night sky has at least one planet orbiting around it. And they believe that many of these planets could harbor life. Here's the problem. The planets are orbiting extremely bright stars, sometimes billions of times brighter than the reflection off the planet. But if you can block just the light from the star, all of a sudden you can study the planet in more detail. Let's go figure out how to block a star's light on this episode of Crazy Engineering. All right, we're here with Nick Siegler in this very fun looking lab. Uh, Nick, can you tell us a little bit about where we are? Mike, we're in JPL's Starshade Lab. What exactly is a starshade used for? Mike, there are two techniques that NASA is advancing to look for life on exoplanets. The star shade basically is a large shade that is flown outside of a telescope with the intention of blocking the light of the star. So then we can see the planet's light skirt the shade and captured by the telescope. Okay, so this is much like I'm looking up at the sun and I want to see a bird or an airplane. I put my hand up to block the sun's light. But we have to do it on a much larger scale for a star. The star shade itself is tens of meters in diameter. That's the size of a baseball diamond. Just about how far away from the telescope would it have to fly? It's tens of thousands of miles. You can fit like four Earths between the telescope and the shade. It's got its own propulsion system. It's literally its own spacecraft. How do we get it up into space? That's the engineering challenge, is how do we get something that has to deploy to tens of meters of diameter that could sit on top of a rock? So now our engineers have come up with a technique based on the ancient practices of origami. 
It sounds difficult. How do you know that's gonna work? Well, we do what we always do. We start small and we work our way up. So we started in this case with something just a few inches in size. Then we built something meter in diameter and we matured up to two meters. And now we finally got up to five meters. The one that flies in space is gonna be tens of meters. Okay, so you're using origami to make this really large star shape. It's a fun mechanical engineering project. But you mentioned that NASA is actually investing in two different technologies. What's the second technology? That one is called the coronagraph. The coronagraph. Can we take a look at that one? Let's go. Okay, Nick, this is obviously a lot different than the last lab we were in. We're in bunny suits now, we're trying to be super clean. Can you tell us where we are right now? Mike, we are in JPL's high contrast imaging test bed lab. This is where we test the next generation space coronagraphs. So I'm gonna stop uh, on the coronagraph. I don't wanna overload us, um, but uh, I did send some, the, the link to make your own star shade and you can actually use this star shade when you're trying to see something in space and maybe, maybe the sun is too bright or maybe another star is too bright. This is mine. I'm still feel, still fiddling with it. It doesn't quite wrap in and wrap out the way theirs does, but it's certainly a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, I like it. Also, there's also for very young astronauts, um, just starting out, there's a coloring page uh, that I sent to the rover. Actually, I don't have a link there for it, but if you just um, search up uh, NASA's coloring book, coloring page, you'll find lots of things for young children. And one thing I really liked was the zip line video. Sorry, the zip line. Hi, this is Oda from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Today, we're going to learn a little bit about how NASA lands spacecraft on planets and moons. And then we're going to try our hands at it ourselves with objects we have lying around the house. Landing on another planet that is constantly in motion, rotating on its axis and revolving around the sun can be tricky. Spacecraft like NASA's Perseverance Mars rover travel really fast through space toward a target landing spot on the surface of a planet, in this case, Mars. Because the rover will be landing by itself with no real-time help from people on Earth, scientists and engineers must do a lot of work in advance, understanding the forces and motion involved, and then programming the computer to make sure the rover lands at the right spot. Other missions, like NASA's Cassini mission to Saturn, remain in orbit and drop a probe to the surface of a moon to investigate and gather data. This also requires understanding a lot about the forces and motion involved. NASA's Artemis program will launch astronauts from Earth to a moon orbiting gateway station. From this gateway, astronauts will fly on a lunar lander to land on and explore the moon. As you can see, it's necessary to understand the motion of all the objects involved the spacecraft, the lander, and the planet. Now, let's set up a challenge for you to try this at home. You'll need a few materials, about nine feet of string or anything string-like, so fishing line or dental floss will also do, a disposable cup, a paper clip, some tape, scissors, and a marble or other object that will serve as your lander. You'll also need a target of some sort. Print out our template or make a target of your own. Set up a zip line by tying the ends of the string to two chairs, or use a door handle and a chair. One end of the string should be higher than the other. The more slanted your zip line, the faster your spacecraft will travel. Place the target on the floor under the zip line about two feet from the low end. Use the paper clip to hang your spacecraft cup from the zip line. Make sure the cup and paper clip can slide freely from the top of the zip line to the bottom. Now it's time to design and build your spacecraft. Figure out how to modify the paper cup to carry the marble down the zip line to land on the target using the materials you have on hand. Will the marble travel inside the cup? Outside of the cup on a platform? Underneath it? How will your spacecraft release the marble lander while zipping down the line? Consider whether you will use an automatic release system or a remotely activated release system. If you'd like, you can use additional string tied to your cup to create a remotely activated release system. Now, 
test your design. Release your cup at the top of the zip line and try to land your marble on the target while your spacecraft is moving. Use the numbered rings on your target to keep track of your accuracy. Repeat your runs several times to get consistent results. Now, think of how you might improve your design. Make a modification and try the experiment again. Keep making modifications and testing your design after each one to see how accurate you can get. Can you consistently get a bullseye? Getting close to the center of the target is what NASA engineers must do when they land a spacecraft on another planet or on the moon. Keep in mind, this is a really tough challenge. Don't get discouraged. Instead, persevere and even get your family members involved in suggesting ideas. For detailed instructions on this activity, go to this URL. All right, let's check the chat and see what we got here. Okay, I've got a site to convert Earth years to planetary years. I love that. Zip line landing kits, and I've got my I've got my guy here, or woman, or and she's sitting on um, some very fancy equipment. And here's my spaceship. So I made my own zip line at home, and I've been trying to figure this out. But I got an idea. I'm going to try tonight how to get how to get my uh, person out on the target because I missed it many times. But like she said, this is a tough challenge, but have fun and don't give up. We got activity kits. Can I have a star shape in my car to keep the sun out of my eyes? Probably could, probably could have that. <laughs> All right, so. So I hope you all enjoyed those activities. And again, NASA has so many things uh, online. It's really, it's really nice. I really like that about their website. So the second part of this presentation is about diversity. And when we think about the word diversity, uh, we use it a lot. Sometimes um, I tend to think of it in a limited way. And then I thought to myself, well, hey, Diversity can mean lots of different things. Uh, can we, if anybody would like to join me in thinking this out, what do you think when you think of diversity? Oh, wait a minute. When you think of diversity, you think of the word diversity. We're talking about in terms of uh, people in the solar system program. What do you, what comes to mind actually? Because as I said, when I first thought of, when I first thought of the word diversity, I've since expanded that. Matthew said a wide cross section of people. Yeah. Anybody else wanna comment? Specifically, what do you mean by a wide cross-section of people? Yeah, men, women, different races, different countries. Today, I started thinking about People with different abilities too. I don't like the word disability, but people with diff different abilities as well. Yeah, yeah. A group of people having a wide span of belief, racism, heritage, genders. I think that's one of the reasons why people like Star Trek so much because at that time there were so many different types of people, people from different planets, uh, people from, um, yeah, different people from different planets actually. And it was a 
big wide cross section of people there. When I think of engineers um, going into space, I also think of scientists, geologists. Uh, I think of people who have um, disabilities, different types of different, dis different abilities. I think of women, men, people from different countries. That's why I like the International Space Station so much because there's people from many different countries there working together, 125 miles up in the air, in space. So this, uh, it's, and why is important, why is it important to, or is it important to have a diverse group of people, wide cross section of people? going to use, I'm going to uh, take what Matthew gave me. Why is it important? Yeah, better problem solving. True. People feel like they're in, included. Think about that little girl who um, watching tonight and very, very encouraged because she sees other people like her. Um, but if she didn't see other people like her, she may think that it's not accessible to her. So uh, as an African-American, um, I know what it's like to feel like something is not for me because I don't see myself, I don't see myself there. So how diverse is our solar system program? Okay. And so this is an article and I'm not gonna read it to you, but I thought it had some interesting, and I really like the infographics here, really simple really fun to look at. And for every country in the blue, they had number of women. And in the dark blue, they had people of color. And, you know, it's really interesting. Um, I found that very surprising that Canada, I think this is Canada, right? <laughs> Tell me if I got it wrong. 25% of the people in the space agency, Canadian are women, but no people of color. So I was actually surprised. I even thought, could that be an error? But I don't know. Where all the people in Japan must consider themselves people of color. All the, all the people in the space agency are people of color. 25% of those are women. So that I found that very interesting. Let's go, to, let's go to NASA. They don't really say the US. So the light blue is the number of women, 14.7%. When you think about women, what percentage of the US population are women, do you think? Somebody wanna put that in the chat or say it out loud. Yeah, that's right, Matthew. Breakthroughs come from all different places and people. Totally right. I love that. So how, how many, what, what do you think the percentage or you use a fraction or some way to describe women versus men just say and nasa is a u.s organization how many percentage of people how do we express that yeah at least 50 percent, which is pretty cool half are men half are women and there there's also some people don't want to consider themselves e either so i i want to acknowledge that and probably there should be a place for that too uh but we think of 50 percent, and we have 14 15 percent of women and then the dark blue is people of color. I don't really know the percentage. I don't kind of, I'm kind of uh, reluctant to ask. I know the percentage of African-Americans in the country because it's, as long as I've been alive has always been like 12%. But there's, all, there's not just African-Americans that are people of color in the United States. But if African-Americans take up 12%, then it has to be greater than, greater than 12, let's make it 13, let's make it 13% people of color in the United States. I just don't know what that number is. I probably should try to find that out. But here we have 9.3% of the people at NASA are people of color. So, you know, in both ways, in both areas, we have a ways to go. It would be interesting to have a whole crew made of people of color. It'd be interesting to have an entire crew made of women. Uh, and not just for that sake, but uh, to be open to that and for that to happen and for and to have enough applicants. So uh, yeah, so that's that's just a little bit about diversity in the in NASA's program. So just historically, 
And that's at six female astronauts in 1967. Remember, because you're an astronaut doesn't mean you necessarily go in space. And this should be loading in, maybe not. Yeah, I see it loading now, I think. Well, little history. Another thing about all this information is in 1967, something like that, information wasn't so readily available, right? I know that in 1967, I um, wasn't in high school. I was in, um, I was in eighth grade in 1967. But I had no idea there were six female astronauts uh, because, you know, unless you read everything, you there was a lot you didn't know. Information wasn't at the touch of your fingertips. So uh, uh, computers were the size of a two-story building, small two-story building. And all they did was add one plus one. So there wasn't a lot of uh, information. But I do, I have heard of some of these astronauts. All right, Sally Ride became the first American woman in space in 1983. I guess that's why I heard of her. Um, so I, she's actually pretty well known in the space uh, program. Colonel Guy Bluford Jr. became the first African American in space. Can't believe we consider this history. Um, and I'm not sure what year that was. I apologize, I don't know, but I had heard of Guy, Guy Bluford, he's got actually quite a resume and his um, interest in space. Um, and he wasn't really trying to become the first African-American uh, in space that just sort of accidentally happened. Um, but he's got quite an interesting history. So whenever you get a chance, you can read about him. And I like reading about him. Um, then there was the first African-American woman in space. She was accepted to NASA's training program in 1987. Actually, yes, in 1992, almost five, year late, five years later, Mae Jemison became the first African-American uh, in space, the first female African-American in space in 1992. Tell me in the chat if anybody's ever heard of Mae Jemison. I actually heard her speak and I read her book. Uh, she came to Cambridge once. Um, She's quite impressive too. She's also uh, a medical doctor as well. So she's got quite a resume. Yes, yes. People of color in the United States is around 23%. All right, good. I didn't know that. That's really helpful. Thank you, Jody. I never knew what that was, what number that was. So that must be uh, probably, I'm going to guess like nine, nine, eight percent maybe. Uh, Latino and then maybe some miscellaneous, but I had no idea. So it's good to know that. Um, there's a space research diversity uh, program. I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, I'd like to play that. And this is Charlie Booten. Charlie Booten was a, he was an astronaut, then became a NASA ambassador. He speaks a little bit. I'm not gonna let him speak the whole time. This is uh, space.com. So uh, they talk about racism in science and they talk about a lot of issues uh, related to diversity and the issues of diversity, how we can overcome it. But let's see if this loads in. I really like what Charlie has to say. Uh, let's see if we can load it in. There he is. So as a former NASA chief, uh, I don't plan on playing the entire thing. I think it's a little long, eight minutes, a little long. So I'll just play part of it. Let's see if I can find the part I want. But I really like I really like what he had to say. So hopefully you hopefully you do too. Let's see if I can play this. Sound last on. week or so, both uh, Leland Mel. I'm gonna press this up a little bit. Defense Intelligence uh, Agency for a while, and um, you know he spoke out this morning. There was an op-ed from him about. Uh, the experiences that he had growing up and then coming into the Marine Corps. So I think it's, I think it's very important for people in our position, people of color uh, and women to speak out. But I think what is most important is for people like you, for, for um, white leaders. Um, it ought to start with the president. Um, those are the, you know, this is not a, the, the systemic problem with racism in the United States is not something that started this year or last year 
or 10 years ago. I mean, this is this is what our nation was founded on. And and, and people need to realize that. I, I saw a, a young lady at a demonstration. I, I don't think it was in Washington, D.C., but it was several days ago. And she was saying, the system isn't broken. This is the system. This is the way the system was designed. And so if we really want to solve these problems, we've got to go back and uh, lawmakers today have to pretend that they're the Continental Congress and they want to and they want to make this country the way that it really ought to be. People uh, people like to say, you know, this isn't who we are. Well, it is who we are. We are a nation that uh, that has discriminated against people from our very beginning. We have trampled on women from the very beginning. You know, how long have you had the right to vote as a female? Uh, why weren't you able to vote when the nation was founded? You know, why was I three fifths of a human being? Those things. That is the nation that 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 we live in, and this is who we are, and we don't like it. Now that we, you know, now that we're when we look in the mirror, uh, we're looking at something we don't like. Well, that is the nation that we are, and it's up to every single one of us to change it. So, so I call on my white brothers and sisters and tell them uh, everything you want me to say, or you like Leland or May saying, you ought to be saying it. So that would uh, that would be my advice to anybody who's in a leadership. So I'm gonna stop that. I, I really like what you had to say. Uh -oh, uh -oh. Shut that off, go back to the slides. Really like what he had to say. Um, there's a little bit about diversity, diversifying the field of engineering. I'm really not gonna talk about that. Um, and then women on Mars, let's see. I'm gonna pass that up, but uh, I just wanna uh, acknowledge what's in the chat, let's see. Astronaut Stephanie Wilson is from Pittsfield. I am not, I don't really know who Stephanie Wilson is. I'm assuming she's an African-American woman. That's very cool. And yes, she is. Recent article, very nice. Very nice. That's very cool. I know people in Pittsfield must be very proud of her. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, we get more astronauts, actually young astronauts, young children who are astronauts. That's another area of diversity. Do we want to send a child in space? I mean, that's interesting, huh? So uh, and I think, I'm not sure what this Women of Mars says. Let's look at it, okay? I did this a long time ago, I'm not sure. This is space, oh, this is Marie Claire. So I don't know if that's gonna load in. Yes, yes. And so this was an article, um, if you want to take a chance to read it later, I really like Abigail Harrison. Uh, her name is Astronaut Abby. I really liked it and really liked how she uh, made it under 18,300 applications to become an astronaut. And there's a few other women here really like that. So this is, of course, not something for us to do now, but there's Taylor Richardson. Is that the one? No, that's somebody else. All right, she uh, attended a space camp. So if there's any kids out there, you know, go to those space camps and go to those libraries and read on space. Uh, I've been doing that since I've been a little girl. I, I remember reading the same book over and over again. I wish I had that book now, but I, I've since lost it. But um, my interest in space started a long time ago. Um, and here's Richardson again. So I, I thought that was cute, but... Uh, not for today, but you certainly can read it later. And my last thing I want to talk about, it's really cool. I can stop this for a second and I'll check the chat before I start. All right. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jody, putting that link there. And so we're going to the moon again. So I'm shocked. Nobody at the JPL asked me or NASA asked me what I thought about going back to the moon. I, I'm actually kind of surprised they're going back to the moon. Um, NASA will land, but the reason I put this there, this kind of, this is my last slide. This kind of brings both the, both the mission in Mars and the diversity full, full circle and bringing them together because it's gonna land the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. And uh, they're going to use innovative technologies to explore more of the lunar surface. We will collaborate with our commercial and international partners. So there we go with some diversity there too, as well as having people around the world. 
and establish sustainable exploration for the first time. Because remember when I was a kid, um, I don't remember the year when we first landed on the moon. We landed on the moon, we weren't there very long, right? That was like a big deal. But here we're gonna have sustainable exploration. Then we'll use what we learn on and around the moon to take the next giant leap, sending astronauts to Mars. So now I get it. That's why they're sending people to the moon, sort of like it's a practice, right? And I think that's uh, a notable reason to go to the moon. How are we going to the moon? This is a little long, but since my presentation was a little short, I'm gonna feel like I can play it. Let me just check the chat again. All right, oh, thank you. All right, this is on the Artemis program. Thank you. It's sustainable exploration when there is a permanent orbiting, sorry, space station around the moon. I'm gonna take a chance, Matthew, and say yes. Uh, but when I think about sustainable, sustainable exploration, I'm thinking about uh, a presence on the surface of, of Mars. Um, you know, you know, I really don't know. <laughs> I, I really don't know. Uh, let's read it again. Yeah, so you're asking, are they gonna be orbiting or are they gonna be on, on the surface of the moon? Well, let's see, okay? Actually, I don't know, but I think this little piece is gonna tell us. And bear with me, this is the last uh, piece we're gonna have before we have a, some Q&A, all right? Between 1968 and 1972, America launched nine human missions to the moon, six of which successfully touched down, allowing 12 men to walk on the lunar surface. NASA's next chapter of lunar exploration, called Artemis, has the task of not just going to the moon to create a long-term human presence on and around it, but also to prepare for ever more complex human missions to Mars. In short, everything we must be able to do here, we must first do here. So, what will an Artemis mission look like? Everything is designed and tested with our most important element in mind, the astronauts. This is their deep space, human-rated spacecraft called Orion, built in three parts. The crew module, where up to four astronauts will live and work throughout the flight, the service module, with life support systems for the crew and its own engine and fuel reserves, and a launch abort system with engines capable of pulling the crew module to safety during launch should anything go wrong. To accomplish the task of launching our crew in heavy payloads, NASA is building the Space Launch System, comprising of a cargo hold, an exploration upper stage, a massive core stage, and two extended solid rocket boosters. Altogether, this is the world's most powerful rocket, and it exceeds the legendary Saturn V of the Apollo era in numerous ways. Sitting on the launch pad, the entire rocket, fully fueled, weighs just over 6 million pounds, 5.2 million of which is just the fuel. Once ignited, there was no stopping what comes next. All four RS-25 engines and the two solid rocket boosters come to life, thundering our crew upwards. Two minutes after ignition, the solid rocket boosters are spent and released. Eight minutes after launch, the core stage is depleted and separated. The upper stage fires briefly, placing Orion into a parking orbit around the Earth. Here, the crew reconfigure the spacecraft and check systems to confirm everything is ready for deep space travel. With a go from mission control, the crew reignite the exploration upper stage engines to leave Earth entirely. The exact timing of this maneuver is critical to reach a speed that can escape Earth's gravitational pull, but also put Orion on a course that will intersect the moon days later. Once this burn is complete, the upper stage of the SLS is jettisoned and the crew aboard Orion coast for several days toward all that awaits them at the moon. Approaching the moon, we see the fundamental differences between Artemis and Apollo. Instead of requiring Orion to serve as an expendable lunar command module or to carry a constrained lunar lander, the Artemis missions will take advantage of a different approach, pre-staging. Everything needed for lunar missions will be positioned in advance by commercial and international partners. This includes rovers, science experiments, and human-rated systems on the surface. But it also includes a dedicated lunar station in orbit around the moon called Gateway. Here at this station, we can pre-stage a robust lunar lander and establish a strong communications relay. 
Designed with open standards, the Gateway can be expanded as new missions and partnerships develop, allowing multiple human missions on the moon at the same time and enabling ongoing science to be conducted even between human missions. The Gateway is also capable of adjusting its orbit to allow access to every part of the moon, something the Apollo missions could not do. But the real key in this approach is placing Gateway in a unique halo orbit to perfect the maneuvers needed for Mars missions. And with the growing list of commercial and international opportunities, Gateway is the ideal hub between Earth and all that lies beyond. Returning to our crew as they approach Gateway, the Orion must match the elliptical orbit of the station in order to successfully dock. Once on board, pre-selected crew members transfer to the lunar lander, while those assigned to Gateway remain on station. The lunar lander system itself is built for three unique steps. Descending from the halo orbit of Gateway down to a low lunar orbit, descending from low lunar orbit to the surface, and once the lunar mission is complete, launching from the surface of the moon and ascending all the way back to the orbiting gateway. Once back aboard the Orion spacecraft and undocked from gateway, the crew fire their engine once to break out of the halo orbit and once again to sling the spacecraft around the moon, placing it on a multi-day trajectory back towards Earth. As they near the end of this journey, the service module is released and the crew module is oriented heat shield first. Entering Earth's atmosphere at 25,000 miles per hour, the friction of air slows Orion considerably, while also subjecting it to temperatures of 5,000 degrees. With the Orion now at just 300 miles per hour, a series of parachutes uniquely tested and produced for this moment deploy, decelerating the craft to just 20 miles per hour for splashdown. With each successful mission, Artemis ushers in the next wave of men and women to explore our moon and prove that together we are ready to go through it. How you like that, huh? I, I get very giddy about that. So I don't know if it's just nerdiness or what, but I think that's very exciting. Yes the whole moon exploration. I could watch that over and over again. It's very complex, isn't it? Right, right, Matthew, right. Wow, I, I, I really get goosebumps. Uh, I also, um, you know, sometimes people say why we learn this math and, you know, I'm a math teacher and there's lots of reasons, but this is one of them. I can see so much mathematics in that. So that's my presentation uh, today. Um, I hope you all enjoy it. I hope you all get as excited about it as I do. Uh, I certainly want to know if um, if you enjoyed it, if there's anything that um, I can help you with or if anything else, if you ever want me to come back and do something else. I like it all. Um, I like the history of the space, uh, the space program. I like the future. I like the present. Um, you know, so I hope you enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed having you all here. I, I appreciate your questions and your patience with a little bit of my problem with Kahoot, but if I ever came back, I'll make sure that doesn't happen again. Uh, thank you. You're welcome, Sonia. Uh, it's a lot to think about. It's exciting, huh? And so when you're, you're out with people, now we can out, be out with people again, we can actually bring that up and you know, have you heard of the Artemis program or do you know about ingenuity? And you can always go back to this, this uh, presentation. And I tried to pick all the, the uh, exciting and, and uh, visual um, pieces from the NASA website because there's literally thousands of things on their website that I could have picked from. And uh, all their stuff is amazing. So thank you so much. Thank you. If you have any more questions, I'm certainly here to hang on a few more minutes or, um, and like I said, some questions can't be answered, some questions I can't answer. Uh, some of them probably can only be answered by those amazing engineers and geologists and, and artists at, at uh, G JPL and NASA, but uh, questions are good. And questions are why we are there. So uh, sometimes people don't like asking questions because they think it makes them look like they don't know. 
a question shows that your mind is working. So keep asking those great questions. Um, you're welcome. You're welcome, Wendy. And thank you. You're welcome, Phil. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate everybody coming to this presentation. And um, at any way, I'll hang on for a few minutes. Thank you, Benedette. I'm really excited you were also able to um, share some of the Artemis mission. I hadn't even projected my thoughts ahead of time to that. And that's going to be really fun watching the progress they make getting ready for that. Because in my age range, we watched that in school. Like we were really excited and we would see it in the news and think that happened in our lifetime. Um, and it's something I think younger kids often take for granted because they see so much now happening. Um, but yeah, that's going to be fun. Oh, I see a question. Um, how many ambassadors are there? Know. You know, that's a <laughs> phenomenal question. I know um, when I was looking on the NASA ambassador site, um, they broke it down by states. And a friend of mine who has a library in New York State was using one who was over in New Jersey, but I thought I'd like to stay with someone who is, you know, in our own state, which is why I looked around and I saw Benedette and just thought a science teacher and she's in Massachusetts. Um, but we have quite a few in our state even. So when you look at 50 states, um, it's substantial. It's an yeah. amazing program that if, you know, I'd never heard of before till now. Yeah, you know what, um, they send this stuff all the time. They have trainings. Uh, you have to send an application. They also send you really great stuff too. I mean, they send you mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, sorry, what I meant is they, they send you a lot of emails. You don't like emails, probably shouldn't be in the program. But I don't open it all. Sometimes I don't have time. I am a, a full-time teacher and I get very busy. My last day was uh, actually today. But um, but they also send you a lot of fun things. They sent amazing um, uh, calendars that you really can't get any other place. Um, you just can't go out and buy these calendars. Uh, so they, you get a lot of uh, great swag and stuff like that. Not t-shirts and jackets, but I would love that too. But um, it makes you feel like you're a part of something big. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. You know, that's something I've always wanted. So being a NASA ambassador, uh, I tell my kids, I, you know, I know I sound silly, but I'm so proud to be one. Um, yeah. So it's a still, great program. It's a great program. It doesn't cost anything. You apply. I think they probably take everybody. <laughs> and one of the things we do is we just try to keep the, the uh, public informed about what NASA is doing. It's a very right. simple mission and uh, it, it, I love it. So. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. This has been great. And again, if there's if anybody else comes with an, comes up with another topic related to NASA and space, uh, given enough time, I'll be glad to do it. This has been my pleasure. Wonderful. And it's my and passion. Thank, yeah. <laughs> That's exciting. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing it with us and um, for sharing even beyond you know what you'd initially thought you'd be able to do with us. And thank you to the libraries of Otis, Stockbridge, and West Stockbridge for co-sponsoring with us today. Um, we wanted to share it as widely as we can because we serve teeny little towns in the Berkshires. So yes. that, that's been wonderful. You thank know. you, Julie. And uh, look forward to communicating with you again soon, Benedict. Yes, thank yes, you. keep me in mind. Keep me in mind. This is actually my first presentation. <laughs> In three years that I've been an ambassador, uh, I think okay. one or two I wasn't able to do. Uh, I didn't get enough time, but yeah, so I'm, so I'm, I'm revved up now and I can uh, continue to do these. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I would imagine as a teacher, summers are a little easier, but thank you everyone for joining okay. and please answer the survey when you get it uh, uh, in your email in the next day. And uh, we look forward to feedback.